So we're going to look at how to use an AI technique called reinforcement learning to solve the same kind of decision problems we saw in previous videos. Okay, so this is the monster commute to work. The monster commute to work. And really, reinforcement learning, you can think about it, this is how people might do it in practice. Reinforcement learning is a key area of machine learning. There's like three types of machine learning. You've got supervised machine learning, where someone tells you the right answer and you use that to make your system better. Unsupervised, where you don't really know what the answers are, you just make kind of, you sort of structure the data. Reinforcement learning, you don't get told what the right answer is, but you get some signal, typically a reward, that tells you how good the action choice you made or how good the answer so was. how well you did. How well you did, yeah. It's like a pat on the back, two pats on the back, ten pats on the back, things like that. Oh, fantastic. Or in our, in our commute example, it's like looking at your watch and going, oh, I was on time, I arrived in this amount of time. Mm -hmm. So in our commute example, the time taken is your reward signal. And we've been kind of minimizing costs, but in reinforcement learning, people typically talk about maximizing rewards. So we can just think about like the negative of our cost, but or put a how, minus. Oh, like, how early you are for How work. early we are for work. Perfect, perfect. We're good. That's what we're trying to maximize, how early we are for work. And this is actually similar to the Monte Carlo tree search world in that reinforcement learning not only doesn't assume a model, well, let's, let's just say reinforcement learning doesn't assume a model. So we're going to have to learn the probabilities or learn the transitions as we go, and we're going to have to learn the values. And the difference between what we saw in Monte Carlo Tree Search and what we have in reinforcement learning is the assumption underpinning reinforcement learning is we don't even have a simulator. So we can't think before we act. All we can do is act in the world and get these rewards back and use those rewards to change how we act in the future. Okay. So the kind of the original idea of reinforcement learning is it's always online. And instead of thinking, we just act, and then we use the results and, and get better. I'm hoping they're not using this for self-driving cars, then. Uh, well, reinforcement learning is used for self-driving cars, but that, and that's actually the interesting caveat. So in robotics, and actually in a lot of problem solving, you can use reinforcement learning as an offline solution technique if you don't have the model, and you're trying to build a, a policy, particularly with a, with a neural network or some complex internal representation, for very, very difficult problems. So th those kind of difficult problems are problems where instead of our state being I am at home, that state might be the, a camera image or all the positions of robot joints. And you can use neural networks and deep learning to turn those into states you can reason about. But we're not going to talk about that. I'm, I'm lovely and happy in my, my simple commute world with what we'd call discrete states and actions. So these are single discrete separable states and actions, and we can count them, we can enumerate them. And, and so this is a typically almost a toy problem for reinforcement learning. But we'd call it tabular. And that's because we could write a table of all our Q values or a table of all our state values. And the way we write the cost of an action is something called the Q function. And the Q function is the action cost or the state action cost. And so tabular reinforcement learning is, is where reinforcement learning started. And we can use that just to understand, understand what happens. So probably the, the most famous picture in reinforcement learning, and this, this might be all, all we draw today, is you've got some agent, and that agent has a policy, pi, and it uses that policy to choose an action. That action gets executed in the environment. Oh, running out of space, environment. And this environment tells the agent, okay, you've now changed state, and you got some reward for executing that action. So agent picks an action, and the environment executes that action, or the agent does the action in the environment, and then the agent gets told what the next state is and what the, the reward is. So there's no model, no simulator, we only have the environment. In robotics, actually, we, yeah, we might actually replace the environment with a simulator, and then later on try and use that policy in the real world. That's called sim to real transfer, uh, and it's one of the many open problems in this kind of area. This is the basic setup. So the way to think about this learning is, is, is with this commute example. Every day, you wake up, you've got to go to work. You ask your policy, what should I do? You follow the policy, you choose an action, maybe you get in the car, the environment tells you, oh, now you're in, in medium traffic, you drive to work, you get your rewards at each time step of how much, how much time did I take in each step. And at the end of the day, you've written all that down, and you work out how late I was and give yourself a reward based on that. And then the next day, you look at your notebook and go, oh, well, that was a good choice. I, you know, I wasn't very late, so maybe I'll try that again. Mm -hmm. And that's how this is going to work. We're just going to keep track of the rewards we get in each, each sort of trajectory of state. So trajectory will be the sequence, and we're going to use that to calculate changes to our policy 
that tell us to prefer one axe or another over time. Okay, so I'm not imagining being 10 minutes early for work, so I treat myself to a coffee and a donut. Right, 20, That's your reward, yeah. 20 minutes early, I have two donuts. Right? <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe the glow on your boss's face is all you require. But uh, the underpinning maths, which we're not really going to go into, is, is really just the same as the maths we saw for Monte Carlo tree search and the maths we saw for value iteration. There are Bellman equations, and we're going to use sample averages in those bell, in, in, from the data we get from acting in the real world to work out the bell, to, to solve the Bellman equations. Basically, we're going we're to compute Q values for each action, and then our policy is going to be the policy that minimizes Q values, and more or less, we're, we're going to try and minimize the expected value. So, very similar to Monte Carlo tree search, but now we don't get to think in advance about all the possible options. We only have our policy that tells us what to do. The first couple of times I do this, Different actions will have different values, and I don't know, is that the right value or not? It might be that you accidentally happen upon something that's very rare, and you end up, that affects everything else. Yeah, well, you need to even try that potential rare thing, so you need to either explore or exploit. That's the answer I was looking for, Sean. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. So we, we, we have this, um, we have uh, explore versus exploit, we might as well write that again, because it's kind of key. Um, so we still have exploration, versus exploitation. And this is even really a bigger deal in reinforcement learning. If you assume that this is in its kind of fundamental uh, kind of way of doing it, where you're literally every day you're acting, if all you're doing is trying random ways of getting to work every day, your average time to get to work is going to be very, very high. You're going to be very slow. So if you're, you know, inventing new forms of transport, going by hot air balloon, right, that's, that's not going to be very... An image of a jet ski down the canal <laughs> in my head, I don't yes. know why. Perfect. But that's, that's probably a quite efficient way to get to work in Oxford, at least. So yeah, if, if you're exploring all the time, you, you find lots of good options, but then, like, you, your average time is going to be very poor because some of those are going to be very bad. You, you, exploitation means I've, when I found a good option, I need to take it more often. So here we're going to think about just more often taking good actions, and that's what the previous the Monte Carlo tree search approach was doing as well in, within the tree. Here we want to do it within the real world. Uh, and, but because we don't have that tree structure, maybe the only thing to think about in, in this um, example is we need to change our policy. So our policy is what's selecting the actions, and the thing that we do in, in reinforcement learning uh, quite typically, is we make something called an epsilon greedy policy. The idea of the, the mass here is that with one minus epsilon, you exploit, otherwise you explore. So you can basically you do epsilon over the number of actions you've got, and that's kind of the probability per action. So you take the best action with this probability, you choose one of all of the other actions with this probability. And typically, epsilon is small, like less than 0.1, maybe less than 0.01. But this is what's going to allow you to balance exploration versus exploitation. The kind of really basic idea of reinforcement learning is you've got this policy that's going to, going to change, choose different things every day, and your job is to actually work out what the best action is, and that will come from Q values again. So the best action is going to be the one in this case that's going to maximize your Q value because we're talking about reward now. Previously we we're talking about cost. And then that's the action, the, the max Q action is the one that gets taken with one minus epsilon and then we try something else otherwise. Like we don't need to go into all of the maths about how this works, but you can just maybe think about just like one through, run through one very quick example of our commute uh, action. And, and what we do is we're going to get some trajectory. So I talked about state trajectories, and that's what the reinforcement learning kind of runs on. So I'm in some state at time t, I take some action at time t, and at time t plus 1 I get a reward, I also get to see the next state, and then I take my next action until the end of time, potentially. And so we have this trajectory of state action reward, state action reward. So if we go to our, our, our example, so I'm at home, and then my policy says take some action. We might think about the, the train, well, no, let's do car, because it's, I think train, we might get ourselves into these infinite loops and the video never ends. So I choose the car, so that's my choice. I get my immediate reward, which was the reward of going to the car. So that could be minus one, so we're just gonna stick a minus in front to make all our, our cost rewards. Uh, and then the next state 
is chosen by the environment. So that might be medium traffic, that's the most likely one. Then I've got my action drive, I get my reward of minus 20, and then it takes me to the next state, which is work, and I'm done. That's the trajectory. And in the simplest form of reinforcement learning, something called Monte Carlo control, so this is another Monte Carlo algorithm, all we're gonna do is kind of work backwards and work out, well, the drive action, in this case, the Q value of drive uh, is minus 20, and the Q value of car in, in these states is minus, uh, minus 21, because I'm gonna add, right, which is, minus 20 and minus one. And the, the value of home is gonna be the, the action which maximizes the Q value over the choices we've got, which we know turns out to be car in the end. And we do this a bunch of times. So this is a Monte Carlo algorithm. And what we do each time, well, this one will never change. This might be minus 20, but say we hit, uh, we, say we hit medium on another trajectory, and then we hit high. Well, these are gonna have, this will have a minus 20 down here somewhere, high will have a minus 70. And then when we're computing the, the Q value for the car, all we're doing is literally looking at minus 21, minus 21, minus 71. And then we just take the average of those to give us our Q value. So we're really just averaging what we'd call the return. So the return is the reward from here on out. So the return you often represent with G, which is like, how much reward do I get from executing this action and going on to the future? So you can think of that a bit like the, the value. This kind of approach is, is very similar to, to the kind of Monte Carlo averaging we saw in the tree for Monte Carlo tree search, except now we're doing this in the real world, right? So we're trying to learn, do this over time, and you'll see all the values kind of converge to the values we knew from the previous videos. Uh, there's one problem with this method, and that motivates a whole bunch of other stuff in, um, in reinforcement learning. So we use this epsilon greedy policy because that forces the exploration. But the problem we've got is our policy that we're executing in the real world is always epsilon greedy. So even if I've been computing to work for 10 years, one time out of 10, I'm gonna pick some random action. And that in some sense is healthy because it allows you to explore different options, uh, but it also is ineffective. If, the, if the, the, the cost of all these different options doesn't change, then being forced to, to expo explore one time in 10 or whatever is kind of a waste of time. Mm. Doesn't really have any effect on the, yeah. Well, no, it does have an effect. It makes you late for work, <laughs> like one day every two weeks. Okay. Uh, so it has an effect, because this is reinforcement learning. We're doing this in the real world, yeah. but it's not gonna give you any more information. And so there's a bunch of other algorithms that do uh, what's called off policy RL, which will work around that. This is something called on policy. There's huge numbers of videos you could you could think about about those. And there's a bunch of different algorithms for, for kind of managing this data in a different way, learning in different ways. In our example, we assume that actually this kind of assumes we've got a finite trajectory because we're working back from the end of the trajectory, summing these, these rewards. Uh, but you can also assume infinite length trajectories and then you can just look at kind of the next step and how much better you got. There's something called temporal difference learning that starts to look into that area. But these are all just kind of lots of variations that people get very excited about uh, and are used in robots and all sorts of cool places, but probably enough detail for, for today on, on the basic algorithms. So yeah, maybe the takeaway is, this is how you might think about people doing it in the real world. They experience things and then they're kind of making judgments based on what they've experienced and occasionally they might try something new. This episode is brought to you by Brilliant, makers of fantastic courses and content like the stuff you're seeing on screen right now. They've got all the math and science, of course, and lately they've really been upping their game with computer science and AI. Just have a look. As you can see, it's all smartly designed, really interactive, and a sense of fun running through it. You can really tell the people that make these courses care about what they're doing and the journey they're taking you on. It's never too late to learn something new, maybe even change your career path. A brilliant subscription also makes a wonderful gift for someone in your life who might be ready for something new. To try Brilliant for free, visit brilliant.org slash computerfile. You can scan the QR code on screen. And of course, links in all the usual places. They're gonna get you 20% off an annual premium subscription.